Well, welcome to the Center for the National Interest. I'm Christian Wayne, a senior fellow at the center and your moderator for today's discussion about foreign policy. It would be an understatement to say that it has been a busy summer with events that impact our national security and our credibility in the world. The events of the past two weeks in Afghanistan call into question many of the fundamental assumptions of American foreign policy and the institutions we use to shape that policy. Already added to our national iconography is the image of Afghans clinging to an American C-17 departing Kabul. And these events do not occur in a vacuum, but could have an impact on our dealings with China, Russia, Iran, and other adversaries, as well as with our allies. We're pleased to be joined today by Robert C. O'Brien, who was the National Security Advisor from 2019 until the beginning of this year. While in that position, Ambassador O'Brien coordinated policy on matters ranging from the Abraham Accords to reacting to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic and military action related to Iran and Afghanistan. He also facilitated successful diplomatic talks between Kosovo and Serbia and advocated a stronger posture against China. Previously, Ambassador O'Brien was the special presidential envoy for hostage affairs, arranging the release of several Americans detained abroad. O'Brien was a managing partner of the Aaron Fox Law Firm and a founding partner of Larson O'Brien LLP. He is currently the chairman of American Global Strategies, LLC. Ambassador O'Brien is going to give some very brief opening remarks, and then we'll have an extended Q&A session running until 1 p.m. Eastern. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time during his remarks or afterwards by clicking on the Q&A button. With that, come on in, Robert, with your opening remarks. We're glad you're here with us. Well, thank you, Christian. It's wonderful to be here with the Center for the National Interest. Uh, the, the connection with President Nixon and, and the history of the center uh, is particularly appropriate given what we're talking about uh, today with Afghanistan and, and American credibility. Uh, obviously, we can't have a discussion of foreign policy and national security uh, at this time without commenting on what we've been watching on, unfold on TV over the past week and a half. And as you mentioned, those, those images that we saw were, are, are going to become indelible. The young man falling from the C-17, uh, the, uh, the Chinook over the embassy. Uh, if they're true or not, we don't know. The, the uh, dogs, the working dogs left in their kennels, uh, left behind uh, the thousands of Americans and Afghans uh, desperately trying to get into uh, Karzai Airport to, to get a relief flight out. Uh, the, obviously, the, the dignified transfer and the <coughs> heartbreaking image of our 11 brains and soldier and, and sailor who, who came home for the final time uh, to Dover this week. Uh, so these are, uh, these are images that are, that are gonna be seared into the consciousness of, uh, of every American, the same way the images of uh, the, that final uh, uh, evacuation from uh, Saigon were seared into my uh, mind as a, as a young 10 year old watching it with my parents on the nightly news. So uh, the, the images have done uh, damage to our credibility and uh, we've already seen uh, some of the consequences of that. But I also want to point out for just a moment that we also saw the best of America uh, this week. We saw thousands of people, and I was involved in some of these efforts, uh, individual citizens, uh, former soldiers, sailors, Air Marines, uh, diplomats, coming together to evacuate people where the government had let uh, them down to evacuate Americans, but also our Afghan partners and enablers and interpreters, uh, chartering flights at their own expense, uh, uh, in engaging with diplomats uh, around the world to, to open their doors to Afghan refugees. And, and so we saw the best of American, uh, uh, the private sector coming together and private American citizens coming together uh, to help under these difficult circumstances. Uh, but, but look, the, our credibility has taken a blow. The Chinese have already, uh, through the, the mouthpiece, mouthpiece of the CCP, the Global Times, uh, has already gone out and told the people of Taiwan that this is your future. They, uh, <clears throat> shortly after the fall of, uh, of Kabul, uh, published images and, and told the people of Taiwan that this is Taipei. Uh, after we invade, the Americans won't be there to help you and uh, accept your fate and surrender now. Don't wait uh, for the chaos to happen. And so uh, we're going to see the Iranians taking advantage of it. Uh, and, and the other thing I'd point out is we're only at the beginning of this crisis. This crisis is not over uh, as much as uh, uh, many folks in the, in the White House and the government would like to see this move on. We've left behind for the first time uh, you know, ever, although uh, I, I understand uh, uh, our, our Pentagon spokesman just recently said we leave Americans behind all the time or Americans get left behind in conflict zones. That's not what we do as a country. We, 
We try not to leave hostages behind. We try not to leave soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines behind. We try not to leave American citizens behind. But we've left hundreds of Americans who want to get out of Afghanistan behind. And, and so we're only at the beginning of this crisis. Now, hopefully it's going to play out well for them. And, and they're in our prayers. And I, I'm, you know, I'm praying for our, our current leadership, uh, whether it's uh, Secretary Austin or Tony Blinken or Jake Sullivan or the president. Uh, like we want those Americans to get home. And so we're, we wish them the best as they execute the strategy. But, uh, you know, to, to pull the American troops out, which were our, our biggest source of leverage, and then hope that the Taliban would, uh, you know, play ball with us and, and uh, protect Americans and, and give them safe passage out of Kabul and Mazar and Jalalabad and Herat and the other places where they're stranded, uh, puts a lot of faith in, in, a, in, a, in a, an organization that we were bombing uh, just a few weeks ago. So uh, th we're just at the beginning of this crisis and it's, uh, it's gonna carry with us for, for many years. And unfortunately, it didn't have to be this way. And uh, I, I was for ending the, our, our engagement, uh, uh, the heavy engagement in Afghanistan and pivoting to the Pacific. Uh, it's something that President Trump advocated, but none of us were for ending it this way. I mean, the idea that uh, you know, we, we didn't have a plan, the plan was to have troops on the ground until all the American citizens were evacuated, until our partners were evacuated, until all of the military equipment was evacuated. Uh, and, and until the, the Taliban met its conditions of, of negotiating in good faith, the Afghan government were uh, fulfilled. Unfortunately, we went about it the wrong way. We pulled our troops out first and then hoped that everything else would fall into place. And, uh, and again, the uh, foreign policy based on hope is, is not one that uh, uh, represents the realism of the Center for National Interest or, or President Nixon or, or, or folks who've, who've been around these, these events for many years. And uh, or the experience and, and wisdom of the ages. So, uh, you know, it, it's been an unfortunate situation. I think at this point, though, we have to talk about what are we going to do going forward. We've already seen the Chinese taking advantage of this. There was a, a pretty chilling report out about the Chinese uh, nuclear breakout, uh, the fact that they're going to be uh, building or in the process of building 200 land-based uh, ICBM silos with, with missiles that can get, be merged with 10 uh, warheads. There's no arms control treaty that that would in any way inhibit the Chinese from a massive nuclear buildup. Uh, the the aggression that we've seen over the past couple of years uh, in the Pacific. Uh, we don't want this to give momentum. The, the idea was to get out of Afghanistan and move our, our combat troops and move our forces into the Pacific. Take the three billion dollars a month that we were spending in Afghanistan and spend that on, on rebuilding the U.S. Navy. Uh, and instead of 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 actually you know using Afghanistan as a as a, a, a way to, to uh, uh, counter China in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, we've given China a propaganda victory of, of enormous proportion. So a couple of, uh, about a week ago, John Radcliffe, the former director of national intelligence and I got together, we were in Jackson Hole and we said, look, what, what can we start doing to rebuild American credibility uh, immediately? And, and what can we do that, that would have bipartisan support, uh, wouldn't cost a ton of money and could, could get through Congress? And so a few ideas we came up with, we published an op-ed in foreign policy. Number one, we have to expedite, <coughs> excuse me, we have to expedite uh, our arms sales to Taiwan. Taiwan has paid cash on the barrel for, for uh, arms. They're keeping Americans employed. Uh, <coughs> they need those weapons to deter China from its bullying activities and the constant incursions into its airspace and in, into the uh, Taiwan Strait over the, the median line. So we ought to encourage our defense contractors to put Taiwan at the, at the top of the customer list and, and start getting the, uh, the equipment that Taiwan needs to defend itself delivered immediately. By the way, I'd say the same is true with, uh, with Poland uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, the Poles have announced their intent to buy 250 M1A1 Abr Abr Abrams tanks, uh, again, to, to put some, some armored teeth between uh, the, their, uh, on their frontier between them and the Russians. We ought to get those 250 Abrams to, to Poland without delay. This shouldn't be a five-year program. And if necessary, we ought to pull out. We, we've got a lot of excess. Uh, we, we've disbanded a number of our armored uh, cavalry units. Uh, we've got lighter. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, Abrams tanks and in, uh, in depots. We ought to get 250 out of the depots, get them up and running, and get them out to Poland right now, uh, and then replace them with the new ones that are being built in uh, Lima, Ohio. And and, and, and then take ours back. Uh, but, but those are some things, you know, expediting arms sales to Poland, to Taiwan that we can do that again, show America is, is, is still a leader that we're still in, uh, uh, in the game and, uh, and to send a message to the Russians and the Chinese. The other thing we can do is we've now pulled all these troops out of uh, 
uh, Afghanistan, and they're 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 the best of our, our country. These these men and women are are, are terrific uh, warriors. We need to reposition them into the Pacific, and we've talked about that. We and the Biden administration has made a point that they want to get out of Afghanistan so they can focus on the the great power competition with China. We need to take some number of those troops, but not perhaps not all, but but a large number of those troops, and put them in Robertson's barracks in in Australia and Darwin. Uh, put them in Palau, put them in the Marshall Islands, put them in uh, uh, American Samoa, put them in Okinawa, uh, put them in, if, if we want to stick with uh, uh, American states, put them in Alaska or Hawaii and the Aleutians or the Hawaiian Islands. But make, make the point that as we withdrew from Afghanistan, we really meant what we said about pivoting to the Pacific and we're taking that combat power uh, that proved so lethal uh, uh, and, and just until recently, and that we're going to put that in the Pacific to deter the Chinese. The other thing we need to do immediately, and, and this may sound like small ball, and it may not be something that people aren't tracking, is we have a compact of free association with Palau, the Marshall Islands, and the Federated States and Micronesia. And that's a terrific uh, agreement that we have with those islands that many of our grandparents and great grandparents fought to liberate and, and protect. And, and they're, they've, they've got very close ties with the United States. And that compact gives us the ability to have military access to massive swaths of the Pacific Ocean. We need to re, re uh, up that compact, and it's being held up now basically because the Postal Service wants more money to de deliver mail to, to the islands. Let's just pay the mail. Look, everyone wants the mail carriers to get paid. We, we all love the post office. Let's pay the post office, guarantee their uh, their fees for delivering that mail, and let's get the compact re, re upped and, and not, not give the Chinese an opening uh, to come into a massive swath of the Pacific Ocean and, and develop relations with those countries. Uh, otherwise, we, we'd be in a position to control their military affairs, their foreign affairs under the compact, and we need to get that done. Another thing we do, we, we don't have embassies in Kiribati and Nauru and Tonga and Tuvalu. We, we try and manage those diplomatic relations from Fiji, hundreds, thousands, and in some cases, miles away from those islands. The, these are islands that have, have great ties to the United States. They send their students to, to school here, especially places like BYU, Hawaii, and uh, USC, and, and the uh, Pacific Coast. We need to have embassies in each of those countries. The Chinese are opening embassies there. We don't have embassies there. And it doesn't have to be a big presence, but an ambassador, a, a Coast Guard or a Naval attache, a, a station, uh, you know, the, these, these are gonna be on the front lines. These second island chain countries are gonna be on the front lines of the, the conflict and the, the competition with China. We need to be in the game. I mean, we just spent, I can't imagine how much money we spent on our embassy uh, every month in, in Kabul. Well, that money's freed up, uh, uh, Tony, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, let, let's open embassies in the uh, in the South Pacific. And at a minimum, the Foreign Service Office will be thrilled. There'll be three more ambassadorships or four more ambassadorships for our, our career FSOs or, or, or for President Biden to give to his big donors. But let's get those islands opened up. Uh, fifth, you know, we talk a lot about protecting Americans of uh, Asian descent and Pacific Island descent. And uh, that, that's been a big issue. And, and you know, everybody who, who's woke wants to uh, protect Asian Americans. We want to do the same. We've we love our Asian American and, and, and Pacific Islander friends. But most of them, most of the Pacific Islanders live in American Samoa. They're Americans, they live out in Samoa. There's 50,000 of them on the island. It's US territory, it's our, uh, it's our country. And yet they don't have a Coast Guard cutter. And the Chinese are just ravaging their waters with illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. Uh, there's no search and rescue. I mean, these are, these are maritime people that, that travel. There's no, there's, there's, there's no military presence there. We need a Coast Guard cutter. And this is something that we, uh, at the end of the Trump administration, uh, did a, a survey to see if we could turn the old naval base at Pago Pago into a, a Coast Guard station. Let's put a, a national security cutter there. Let's put a fast response cutter there. Uh, base our Coast Guard families there. They'd love the islands. And uh, it, it'd be a, a real message to the Chinese that we actually care about Pacific Islanders and that we're gonna protect their fishing, their, their native, uh, and indigenous fishing rights uh, against the Chinese that are just uh, strip mining the sea, so to speak, of, uh, of fish. Again, not a big deal to put a, a cutter there. Antarctica, which is supposed to be developed for, you know, used as a research base for peaceful uh, research. The Chinese uh, don't let us inspect what they're doing in Antarctica. They've, they've abused the treaty. We only have one heavy Coast Guard cutter, the uh, uh, icebreaker, the, the Polar Star. They can get down and break ice and get to our, our uh, research base there. We need to base, and unfortunately it's, it's based up in Seattle. So it takes longer for it to get on station than the time it can actually spend on station. 
and get back. And Antarctica borders the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, it borders all the oceans, but it, it's a key to the Indo-Pacific. Let's take that Coast Guard uh, icebreaker, let's base it down in Hobart, let the Australians pay for the basing and burden share with us, and let's have it on station uh, monitoring what the Chinese are up to and resupplying our bases. Uh, last thing I'll mention is uh, uh, th this competition with China is global. Uh, let, let's, let's take a look at Somaliland, which is a great country in uh, the Horn of Africa. It just had, it established diplomatic relations with Taiwan. It's preventing one belt, one road from coming through uh, uh, Somaliland. It's uh, <clears throat> got a strategic location uh, just, just near Djibouti where the Chinese, where we have a base and the French have a base and the Japanese have a base, but the Chinese now have the biggest base in, uh, in Djibouti. Let's recognize Somaliland. Let's recognize the fact that they've stood up to China and, and there'll be a huge counterterrorism force as we face these uh, jihadis leaving Afghanistan and going to places like Somalia, like the Sahel. Let's recognize Somaliland and, and give them a, a, a boost up for, for uh, uh, standing up to the Chinese in Africa and setting an example in Africa. So there are a lot of things that we can do subtly that don't take a lot of money that, uh, that have bipartisan support that can very quickly start to reestablish US leadership. I mean, it took us four years of, after Vietnam of the Carter years uh, uh, of losing uh, countries like Mozambique and Nicaragua and Angola and Afghanistan and uh, uh, to, to the Soviet wave until Ronald Reagan finally came back and said enough is enough. America's gonna reassert its leadership in the world and the free world's gonna fight back. And, uh, and we stopped uh, the Soviet takeover of Grenada. We stopped the, the guerrilla insurgency in, in El Salvador. We, we put an end to, the, to the, the, the march of the Soviet bear. We, need, we, we don't have four years this time to, to, uh, to restore our leadership in the world and our credibility. And, and there are steps that we can take immediately going forward. So uh, that, that, that's what I would encourage uh, you know, Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin and, and National Security Advisor Sullivan as they advise the president. We need to get back in this game quickly and we don't have, we, we can't wait for another you know, Iran hostage crisis uh, and, and a Reagan presidency for the country. We have to, uh, yeah, we, we have to get, get to work right now, reestablishing our leadership. Peace through strength works. The rest of the world is depending on us. They're concerned, they're worried, and, and we need to give them reasons to, uh, uh, to believe that America is, is, is not left the playing field. So with that, uh, Christian, all of those are probably remarks were a little longer than you wanted. Uh, There's a problem with seating the floor to a lawyer. Uh, but uh, with that, let me turn it over to some questions and answers, which will be far more interesting than, than, than what I've come up with to talk about. Sounds good. Thank you, Robert, for those introductory remarks. Members of the audience have questions. Please just click the Q&A icon on your screen and submit a question. Uh, if you could include your affiliation, that would be helpful as well. Robert, uh, I'm interested in talking more about some of the transformation and repositioning of force issues you just mentioned. But before that, Circling back one more time to Afghanistan, Cheryl Bernard, writing for the national interest, uh, basically implied that once the election uh, occurred in the United States, that there was a change that the deal that Zal Khalilzad had worked out with the Taliban and with the former government, the now former government of Afghanistan, required negotiation, a discussion of power sharing. Uh, but that after the U.S. election, that President Ghani of Afghanistan really ceased to negotiate in good faith, uh, was more focused, was sort of told by our military industrial complex, our lobbying complex, if you will, that President Biden was going to go with the generals, was going to keep us in Afghanistan. So question is, you are still in that position uh, as national security advisor. Did you see a change in the politics of Afghanistan from before and after the U.S. election? Well, no, look, we made it clear to the Taliban and to President Ghani uh, that, that they had to negotiate, that it was time for the Afghan people to determine their own future. And we wanted to see good faith negotiations on both sides. Uh, I, I'm sure there was hope uh, uh, among uh, you know, folks at the Pentagon who, you know, given their lives and, and, and spent their entire career in Afghanistan, that uh, a Biden administration would come in and, and change everything that happened in the Trump administration. And one of the changes would be the the policy on Afghanistan, but uh, uh, we made it very clear that uh, the U.S. was eventually going to leave Afghanistan. That was something I uh, believed to be the case, uh, even with President Biden. He'd made the uh, uh, the case for getting out of Afghanistan. Uh, again, I'll, I just want to reemphasize: no one thought we'd get out of Afghanistan in the manner that we did. I mean, it's uh, it's really uh, 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 heartbreaking for the American people, for the lives that were lost, and for the the Americans who were left behind. And uh, 
uh, you know, that, that was never in the cards. But what was in the cards is that the Afghan government and the Afghan uh, Taliban, the opposition, had to negotiate in good faith and come up with some sort of transitional government. Now, the leverage that we had, we had a lot of leverage with the government, obviously, because we had troops there and we were, we were basically underwriting the government, uh, you know, in, in many ways as a corrupt government and, and billions of dollars in U.S. taxpayer money through, through many administrations, Republican and Democrat, uh, you know, ended up in, uh, in the UAE and, and Caymans and other places, sadly. Uh, but we had leverage over the government, but we also had a lot of leverage over the Taliban because the Taliban understood, especially when President Trump was there, uh, that we would not be pushed around and that uh, any attack on the Americans, on American soldiers or, or civilians would be met with a devastating response. And, uh, and so we had a lot of leverage uh, with the Taliban as well. Unfortunately, the leverage that we had against both, on, on both sides uh, uh, was quickly uh, dissipated uh, yeah, in the new administration. The, the negotiations never really took place uh, um, and, and blame can go around to both sides, but, uh, and then we decided to pull out without executing a, a withdrawal of our, for, of our civilians and interpreters and enablers and, and equipment first. So uh, un unfortunately it didn't play out well, and, and, but, but we had a lot of leverage on both sides to keep those negotiations ongoing. Unfortunately, that, that leverage was given away. And, and, and once that leverage went away, the, the prospects of, uh, of negotiating Zal, Zal was put in a very difficult position without, with no sticks and, uh, and only a few carrots. Uh, tough, tough, tough role for, for Zal to be in, 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 in Doha doing those negotiations. Right, understood. Um, the next question uh, from the audience, I'm actually going to combine it with one that was on my list. The audience question comes from Nicholas uh, Gav Gavozdev. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm mispronouncing that, sir, but uh, a gentleman from the Naval War College writes, you've sketched a vision out for the future that sees the larger Indo-Pacific Basin as the key strategic arena for the United States, from Antarctica to Australia to Somaliland. Do you think the U.S. national security system can be flexible to respond and can we disengage from Europe and the Middle East? I'd like to combine that with something that appeared uh, with, in the national interest today. It's an article from Jim Webb, an interesting guy, former Secretary of the Navy in the Republican Reagan administration, and then a Democratic member of the Senate. And he wrote uh, in the national interest, and this is the top link story right now on Real Clear Politics. He said, in a perverse way, perhaps we should look at the calamitous blunderings in Afghanistan as an opportunity to demand a true turning point. Americans know that a great deal of our government process is now either institutionally corrupt or calcified. Later he writes, most Americans can clearly agree that what they have been seeing time and again, domestically and overseas is not good government, despite honorable intentions among many dedicated people. So combining these two questions, uh, this seems to be a moment where we could step back, see that we have uh, have a number of sort of bad assumptions in our foreign policy, have made serious mistakes, maybe don't have the military we need going forward. The question is, do we have the capability to affect the type of reform that you talk about that others are mentioning? Really, that would be sort of akin to Goldwater Nichols on steroids, maybe as big as any change since the National Security Act in 1947. Well, it's great that you brought up the National Security Act. I mean, what, what I try to do is, a, is the National Security Advisor, and, and again, it's, you know, these things vary between Republican and Democrat administrations. You know, when I, when I got there, even three years into the, uh, almost three years into the Trump administration, two and a half years into it, the, the National Security Council had a bloated staff of policy professionals. And, and I said, I wanted to institute the Scowcroft model. And it's almost like a religious incantation. Every new National Security Advisor comes in, either party, and they they invoke Brent's name and, uh, and we're going to do the Scowcroft model. Uh, but what that meant to me is that we'd have one deputy uh, and that deputy be accountable to the, the uh, National Security Advisor. Matt Pottinger was my deputy, as, as most of you know, uh, that we would slim down the National Security Council policy uh, process and, uh, and make it accountable. And we, we got down to about 108 policy professionals. That's the number that uh, Secretary Rice had when she was National Security Advisor managing a war in Af Afghanistan, a war in Iraq, the global war on terror and, and everything else that, uh, that we were up against. And we, we had gotten up to well over 200 under uh, uh, the, the Obama administration. And most of those, uh, those same folks had stayed around through the first couple of years of the Trump administration. Uh, our, my idea was to slim it down and, and, and to be action focused uh, and not action focused in the sense that, uh, that it was during the Obama administration where Folks from the NSC directors were calling forward operating bases and ordering uh, uh, mortar uh, rounds to be launched and things of that nature. 
I, I want to put the responsibility for action back on the State Department, back on the Department of Defense, Department of Commerce, Department of Treasury, USTR, but, but make sure that we, we, we had a, a, a quick uh, process when there was a crisis or on long-term issues uh, to get the best advice, the best counsel of the President of the United States. If there was a, a divergence of opinion, we'd have get, give the departments their day in court in front of the President in the Oval Office of the Situation Room, come up with a, a decision from the President on where we wanted to go, and then move out with that decision, task it to the departments, and use the NSC to monitor to make sure that the president's instructions and <clears throat> policy choices were being implemented. I, I thought that was a Scowcroft model. I thought that was how we could get things done. And, and when you look at what we were able to do, uh, the Abraham Accords, uh, which is you know four, four deals between Arab countries and Israel, and it wasn't just about peace for peace sake. I mean that, that's important, but it was also about creating alliances to help contain Iran to help. To, to allow us to pull back, to give our partners the weapon systems they needed to defend themselves, uh, to encourage cooperation between the UAE and Israel, for example, vis-a-vis -vis Iran so that America didn't have to carry the heavy burden there. That would allow us then in turn to redeploy uh, troops and, and uh, assets to platforms to the uh, Eastern Europe and to the Western Pacific. So, so there was always a strategic goal behind it. It was, it was the UAE investment money into Israeli startup uh, tech companies so as we were using the CFIUS process to push the Chinese out of our tech sector, that they just didn't set up camp in Tel Aviv and the, the, the new Silicon Valley of the world and, and invest in those countries. Instead, we were getting UAE, or in those companies, we were getting UAE money invested in, in Israeli startups uh, and, and pushing the, the, uh, uh, the Chinese money out of the Israeli tech sector. I mean, it was things that, like, like that, that that made sense. But the idea was to, to have an, a, an accountable system uh, within the NSC, with a, which was set up by the National Security Act, as you mentioned, and, and and to tee up decisions for the president, get those decisions made, and not have endless meetings after meetings after meetings where where no action is taken. One of the things that that came out early in this crisis, and I I, I don't I, I like Jake Sullivan. I think he's a very smart guy. Uh, I, I don't think he should resign or be fired as a result of uh, this crisis, especially in the middle of the the crisis that we're. Uh, uh, seen unfold right now, there'll be plenty of time for the blame game of whoever's you know to blame. And I think ultimately, that as President Biden said, the buck stops with him. Uh, but early on in this, as this crisis was unfolding, uh, the the White House press uh, office put out a statement and said there were 37 deputy committee meetings and principal committee meetings on Afghanistan, as if that was exculpatory evidence of of how could this have happened and and we were doing everything we could, but. Uh, surprisingly, it was CNN that, uh, that had some folks at the State Department and the Pentagon saying, yeah, those, it was meeting after meeting with no decisions being taken and time was being wasted. So uh, again, oftentimes in government, we confuse meetings with action. We confuse being busy with actually accomplishing uh, achievements and, and policy victories for the United States. So you know, I, I think that, that uh, Secretary Webb, Senator Webb makes a, a good point that, that things have gotten calcified. Uh, you know, sometimes you... You know, you spend four hours in the situation room or in a, in a, in a conference room in the EOB and you think, gosh, we really did a lot today. The, the bottom line is you didn't do anything. It was like a faculty lounge meeting at Yale and, uh, and it didn't move the ball forward. It didn't protect American interests. It didn't protect the American people. So, so I think there, there, there's a lot of truth to what he says about, uh, you know, getting, getting rid of the calcification. It's something we try to do with our reforms. Uh, unfortunately, they were reversed pretty quickly and, uh, and the staff, my, my understanding of the staff is ballooned again at the NSC. And I, I'm not sure that's a good thing where you've got super senior directors and coordinators and czars. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to look at an org chart and figure out who's, who's in charge of what issue. Uh, I think there are six deputies now. Uh, so, I, you know, I, again, I don't think uh, General Scowcroft felt that was a good model. I don't think Henry Kissinger felt it was a good model. I don't think Condi did or Hadley did. And, uh, and I certainly didn't. So, uh, you know, we'll have to, uh, We'll have to do our best going forward. Hopefully there will be some lessons learned. And, and again, one thing that I think we need to do is, uh, you know, and, and I hope, you know, Jake and, and, and Secretary Blinken and others look at some of the things that we did and, and, and realize those guys got a lot done. And uh, they got a lot done because you know, of some of the reforming efforts that they undertook. And just because it happened in the Trump administration doesn't mean it's bad. We can, we can learn lessons. We, we've got to be better as Americans and, and learn lessons from, uh, uh, prior administrations, both good and bad. And, uh, and I think one of the good lessons that you could take away from our National Security Council, especially in the last two years of the administration, uh, was that, that reforming the council, 
uh, streamlining decision making and and uh, and tasking out the departments uh, with action items and then holding them accountable, which you know states not used to being held account to being held accountable. DoD certainly isn't used to being held accountable for for what they've been tasked with. Give them the mission, hold them accountable, and, and let people uh, do their job, and, and a lot can get done for the American people. Uh, real quickly on the issue of, of China, look, we have to, we can certainly this is a competition that we can win. Uh, we have to be smart about it. We have to build the navy that uh, uh, that can deter the Chinese. We have to get into hypersonics. That's one thing that I am I am glad the administration is following through on. It was my number one defense uh, issue at uh, when I was national security advisor was making sure that the Pentagon restarted and uh, and started deploying hypersonics, not just researching them, but deploying them. The Chinese have deployed thousands. The Russians have deployed hundreds. Uh, you know, we, we need to get back in that game so we can deter uh, both those adversaries with our own uh, advanced weaponry. And I, and I think we're moving forward on that front, but uh, we've got to stay, stay focused like a laser on the challenge that's being presented by the PRC and the Communist Party of China, and, and also by a, a resurgent uh, Russia with uh, under President Putin. You know, you talk about China, you partially answered the next question, uh, but I, I think we could address it from a different angle. It comes from Joseph Bosco which is uh, what can the Biden administration do to repair some of the damage to U.S. credibility regarding the defense of Taiwan? You've already spoken a lot about military defense posture um, and, and some of the steps taken uh, under your watch uh, to increase Taiwan's defensive capability, to increase the cost for Beijing to attempt a military takeover of Taiwan. So perhaps uh, you can talk about broader strategic goals, which... Uh, I'm curious, what is the best approach? I mean, should we look at the CCP as the modern incantation, or excuse me, uh, uh, as the modern existence of, of the USSR, an axis of evil, something that we should try to consign to the ash heap of history? Should our political pressure be um, <laughs> more measured? Should it uh, try and, and, and look at, at the Chinese system, see that it's a, a hardliner, much more so than his predecessors in power now, Xi Jinping, and what we want to try and do is, is exert pressure such that we might get a Gorbachev out of the situation or uh, going back farther in Soviet history, a Khrushchev who was after all more moderate than Joseph Stalin. Um, you know, what are the political warfare type things and what are the, the sort of top line national strategy we should have toward China's government? Yeah, so that's a great question by, uh, by Bosco and by yourself. Uh, uh, look, the First of all, let's, let's be clear. China is not, uh, the, the, the modern CCP is not the Soviet Union. I mean, the Soviet Union to, to some extent was a, a, a Patonkin village. Uh, you know, we've got a billion three or billion four, depending if you believe their census or not. I think they play as much, many games with their census as, uh, as the Commerce Department under the Biden administration has done with ours. Uh, but uh, uh, however many people is a lot of people and they're hardworking as heck, uh, they're smart. Uh, they've, uh, they've got a hybrid uh, capitalist communist system that, that uh, allows for massive production. Uh, it's the second largest economy in the world. It could be the first largest in a few years if we don't uh, play our cards right and if we don't burden our economy with this, you know, met trillions of dollars in, in, in debt that, that goes nowhere. Uh, so it's a, uh, it's a formidable adversary and it's an ad adversary that's far more formidable than the Soviet Union I think ever was. And, and we've got to recognize that. You know, as far as changing the, you know, I, 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 I'm not a big regime change uh, uh, person. Uh, you know, I think it's hard to change regimes. I think, uh, uh, and, and when you have authoritarian governments that are willing to put bullets in the heads of their uh, citizens, whether it's in uh, Iran or Venezuela or, or China, uh, you know, I think we have to be very, uh, very cautious with playing with people's lives in those countries when we encourage them to, to change regimes. Uh, but I, I, I do think that we have to use all the tools of American national power uh, as we confront the Chinese. Now, I'll, I'll give you a plug, Christian. You wrote a great book on, on political warfare a couple of years ago. And, and for those of you who are watching it, it, it's a few years old, but it's still very relevant. And it, it was a book that I uh, enjoyed because it, it really focused on how do, you, how do you play against the Chinese across all the spectrums of economic power, diplomatic power, uh, cultural power, military power, and... Uh, you know, I focused a lot on trying to get to, to rebuild our military after eight years of it being decimated uh, under President Obama and and having uh, you know folks at the Pentagon, whether it was Esper or others who were Mattis, who were 
uh, really focused on CENTCOM and, and uh, really focused, you know, the entire focus of the Pentagon was on Afghanistan and Iraq. And instead of being focused on China, instead of being focused on hypersonics and a, and a rebuilt Navy and uh, uh, presence in the, in the second island chain and the first island chain, trying to figure out how to get, uh, you know, distance on our, uh, our carriers uh, for, for strike purposes. Uh, how do we extend the, the distance that we can, we can strike? Uh, whether it's unmanned or, or coming up with a new uh, aircraft that, like the A6 that could deliver ordnance uh, over long ranges. So I, I spent a lot, of, a lot of time focusing on those issues, but, it, but it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's 5G. When I came into office, people said, look, we've lost 5G to Huawei. We'll just have to figure out how to mitigate or ameliorate the, uh, the loss. And, and we said, no, we're going to win the 5G battle. And we employed Secretary Pompeo and, and Lighthizer and, and Mnuchin and Kudlow and myself and and, and most importantly, the president to make calls to foreign leaders. And we shut down Huawei in, in swaths of Europe, <clears throat> excuse me, in big swaths of the Pacific. And, and we didn't give the 5G backbone, the free world to the Chinese to suck up every bit of data on, you know, from your, your grandmother's medical records to your, uh, uh, your cell phone calls to your social media, everything would go through 5G. It would have gone through the Huawei back, backbone and it would end up in, in Beijing clouds. So we can compete against them. We need to get, you know, look, we need, uh, Broad, broadband and spectrum. Uh, we need the, the Defense Department and others to make uh, spectrum available so that we can have real 5G that covers not just the big cities in America, but that covers the entire United States of America so that everybody here has access to 5G. And then what that will do in turn is, is, is uh, incentivize our manufacturing base because there'll be a lot of 5G here. There'll be a, a reason to build 5G phones that are compatible with the US 5G system. And maybe we can get some cell phone manufacturing and mobile phone manufacturing, or at least chip manufacturing and component manufacturing back to America. So we've got to free up spectrum uh, uh, here so we can stay in the, the race with the Chinese. So there, there's, a, there's a lot we can do uh, across all, you know, using all of our tools, not just the military, not just having a 355 ship Navy with, uh, you know, lots of, uh, of frigates and, and destroyers and submarines, but, you know, ha have, you know having broadband out there, uh, uh, being in the diplomatically engaging in the in the second island chain, uh, uh, moving troops uh, out of Afghanistan and Iraq into into the Pacific. So there, there's a whole range of things that we need to do. It's not just a military solution. Right, and thank you for the plug of my book. The uh, commission check is in the mail. I should add, Robert, that we've uh, used your law firm. This is before before the Trump administration, but uh, as a as a in a corporate matter. And I've never once been to jail, so obviously you're doing something very well yourself. Um, next question from George Beebe with the Center for the National Interest. And he asked, many Americans are frustrated that elected and appointed government officials who oversee the kinds of failures that we see in Afghanistan are never held to account. No one apologizes, no one is fired or reprimanded. And the same old mistakes keeps getting made over and over again. How can we hold these people accountable in a way that helps our country correct its errors? And I would just add to that, um, you know, Robert, you were in the Army, but uh, have, have great knowledge about naval matters. And my understanding is if you're in command in the Navy, if you collide with another ship, even if it's not entirely your fault, that's the end of your career. Uh, isn't it odd that we seem to be holding uh, officers up to grade 06 to an extremely high standard, but that our four stars, our three stars, people who had intelligence agencies uh, seem not to be held to account? No, it uh, it seems that failure is a uh, you know a straight line to a board membership at a uh, you know at Raytheon or Boeing. Uh, so uh, no, listen, we we need to. And there, there's a lot of uh, of discontent right now in the officer corps at, at the 06 level and below in the in the non commissioned officer corps. I mean, it's it's not just Twitter, but chat boards and message boards are just a buzz with uh, folks saying, hey, if I lost my pistol or uh, uh, you know lost my night vision goggles, I'd be uh, court martialed. Uh, you know, at, at least a, a Article 15, uh, uh, you know, proceeding against me for, for, you know, losing a weapon, I could be busted down a rank. And, and we left behind, you know, whatever, $20 billion worth of equipment. I mean, we, we basically equipped the, the, the IRGC for the next 20 years. I assume that that'll be the biggest purchaser of, uh, of helicopters and combat aircraft and, uh, and, and uh, Scan Eagle drones and everything else that we left behind. Uh, so I think Iran or whoever's, you know, I, I assume it'll be the Iranians, but the Pakis as well. Uh, there's going to be American military equipment being used against our friends and allies and potentially against us for, for many years to come. 
and yet there doesn't seem to be any accountability. I mean, there used to be a time when when folks would resign uh, over these sorts of things, but no, no one resigns anymore, and uh, no one's fired. And uh, you know, so I understand the frustration in the in the junior officer ranks. I think it's it can be a little hard with the uh, to lump that onto the uh, uh, the Pentagon leadership because you know ultimately we have civilian leadership and. Uh, and, and that civilian leadership can be uh, can be very brutal, uh, especially in Democrat administrations and in enforcing orthodoxy over at the Pentagon. <laughs> it, Republican administrations haven't mastered that. Uh, the Pentagon seems to do what it wants in Republican administrations, and 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 uh, you know bends pretty quickly to the political will of the uh, of the president and Democrat administrations. But uh, you know that's just a you know it's all anecdotal. But I, I think it's a, it's a little tough to put these. Uh, uh, failures just on the hands of the or on the at the feet of the generals of the admirals. I think ultimately it's at the feet of the president of the United States and and uh, the policy that he implements. And we have civilian leadership in the military. So I understand the frustration with with senior officers, but I think you know that should probably be more directed at the uh, you know, at the the political leadership of the country who, who need to take responsibility. Right. Understood. And I want to touch very briefly on a cultural issue, which may sound strange for a nonpartisan think tank focused on strategic realism. But these issues have actually started to enter our foreign affairs. So again, I want to just throw this out and get your impression. Secretary Blinken, Secretary of State, today said in a statement on the inaugural International Day for people of African descent, he said, quote, we must get at the root of the challenges and address structural racism while acknowledging the intersections of gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, disability, ethnicity, religion, and national origin. Later, he added, it is only by facing the painful truth of our past and not shrinking from our current responsibilities to address systemic racism that we will forge a better future. Just curious, what impact does this, what I would regard as unfair self-criticism, have on our standing in the world and our foreign affairs? And it, is it actually even the proper role for American diplomats, who are supposed to be our advocates, to really spotlight these supposed flaws in the United States? Well, I mean, that, that sounds like something that, that our POWs used to have to read in a self-denunciation in, in the Hanoi Hilton. I mean, that's... It, 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 it's really quite shocking to, to hear that sort of thing, and uh, and, and again, I think it's a, it's a difference, uh, you know, between uh, individualism and uh, and individual responsibility. I mean, I remember when I came out, uh, and I thought leaned very far forward uh, right after the uh, the George Floyd murder, which was a, a horrific event, and uh, you know, uh, the president immediately called for an FBI investigation, and and I went on TV and said, why is it just that? Uh, Chauvin's been arrested and not all the, the other cops that were standing around, they should be arrested too. And, uh, and then I was asked if I thought there was systematic racism. I said, no, I don't think there's systematic racism. I mean, there's no apartheid uh, regime in this country. And anyone who you know, claims there is, is, uh, is wrong about this country. This, this is the, as Ronald Reagan used to say, this, is a, this country is the last best hope on earth for free men and free women. We've got people falling off of airplanes, falling and being killed in wheel wells trying to get to this country. Uh, there's not too many people climbing onto, onto the wings of airplanes to try and get out of this country. So we've got a great country and uh, doesn't mean we're a perfect country, uh, but, but it used to be that sort of criticism, you know, it ended at the water's edge. And I don't know why our diplomats have taken this up. Uh, I don't know why our generals have taken this sort of, of, of thing up. It, it, uh, it makes no sense. I mean, I, you know, when, when the UN ambassador uh, got up a couple of months ago and said that our founding documents are interwoven with white supremacy and we must recognize it. You know, it, it made me think of another UN ambassador that we had, a, a great UN ambassador named Gene Kirkpatrick. And I, I was an 18 year old page on the floor of the convention in, in Dallas in 1984 when Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush were renominated. And Gene Kirkpatrick said something to the extent of when, when the Soviets walk out of arms control talks, when uh, Central American dictators shoot their way to power, uh, with, with Soviet aid in, in, in Latin America, our ally, our, our, our foes don't blame them. They blame American policies of a hundred years ago, but then they always blame America first. Well, I can tell you one thing in the Trump administration, we put America first. We didn't blame America first. And, and I think we've got to get away from the, the blame America first attitude, which is, I and mean, those are things that we're used to hearing from the Iranian ambassador from the from the Russian ambassador, from the Chinese ambassador, 
uh, you know, from the Venezuelan ambassador. They're not things that we should hear from the American ambassador to the UN or the American Secretary of State. So look, we we have issues in our country, and uh, and we've got to resolve those issues, and we do it through we do it through the ballot box, uh, and we do it peacefully, and 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 you know. Uh, but, but, but it goes hand in hand with the cancel culture. I mean, people want to cancel George Washington. They want to cancel Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, they want to cancel. I mean, people now want to cancel Dr. Martin Luther King. They want to cancel Harriet Tubman because she she used weapons to defend herself. I mean, uh, you know, they want to cancel Teddy Roosevelt. I mean, it, it, this is just they want to cancel Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher or Pope John Paul II, who won the, the Cold War for us. Uh, we, we've got to get rid of that. We've got to celebrate these these men and women in the public square and uh and stop with this this self criticism, which is you know some of these are, sound like scripts that could have been written by, you know, a camp commander in uh, in, in North Vietnam as opposed to uh, being written by a speechwriter. The other thing is you can't understand half of them. I mean, that's the the only good news is when they talk about all this stuff, uh, it's such gobbledygook that most Americans and I don't think most foreigners, <laughs> even those with a good command of English, have any idea what they're talking about. I think outside of the the faculty lounge in Cambridge or or New Haven. People don't even know what some of this stuff means, which is which is probably good, and we should be, you know, we should be, you know, happy about that. But uh, let, let's talk about the great things about this country. Let's talk about why two hundred thousand Afghans were, you know, are, are begging to come here, and we're trying to, and 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 people are flooding over our borders to, to get here because it's a land of opportunity, uh, it's a land of, of of individual liberty and freedom, and uh, and we'll address our flaws and we'll get better as a country, and we've, we've gotten better as a country. You know, for over the last 220 some years, but uh, but this this self criticism is uh, is really disappointing, and it makes it very difficult to lead and talk about why other countries should follow us as the leader of the free world if we're such a terrible place. You know, I'd, I'd much rather be a you know, and, I, and I, I'm not. But I'd much rather be gay or lesbian in the. Uh, not there's anything wrong with it. <laughs> Put a Seinfeld comment. Uh, but 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 there 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 are you know nine or ten countries in the world that will kill you. For being gay, uh, there are 69 countries where where it's illegal to be gay. Uh, they're hanging, you know, they're they're pushing gays off the roof in uh, of buildings in Tehran and hanging gays from uh, from cranes in Afghanistan. Uh, we don't have that here. Could we be better? Sure. I mean, we can always be better at everything, but and we're getting better. But you know, this, this kind of self criticism in the face of a nasty British world out there, uh, you know, doesn't help the people that that that, that, that do need help, and it, it's really a shame. I take your point. The second time I was back at the State Department, the question came to me, I'm a gay man, whether we should fly the rainbow flag from some of our embassies on uh, Gay Pride Month. And I just thought that was a very odd thing to do, even in some place like South Korea, where you would be offending half of uh, the population. And there are times when it actually is okay to offend half the population, but you think you should pick and, and choose your, your battles. Next question comes from Kurt Mills, a reporter, asks, says that some China hawks have argued that exiting Afghanistan is a boon to the CCP, which seems ridiculous on the face, given the drain on resources and prestige in a non-essential theater, that being Central Asia. How do you respond to that line of thinking, putting aside whatever hit to reputation the manner of the exit caused? So that's basically a question about whether or not this will um, free up resources to uh, deter our apex threat, which I think many people would would think of as China. And if I could throw in another quick question by Joe Bosco that's related, which is whether we should remove ambiguity about our um, uh, possibility of defending Taiwan, whether we should um, say we would defend Taiwan in a war. Well, th those are great good questions by John Kurt. You know, Kurt, Kurt is one of the, uh, the top uh, young political reporters in Washington. He's got a big future ahead of him. I, I, I read his stories all the time. So it's, I'm glad he's on the, on the call and asked a question. Uh, look, I, I think we had to pivot out of, and I, I agree with you, Christian, we had to pivot out of Afghanistan and, and, and focus on the existential threat to our country. But the manner in which we did it uh, uh, turned something turned something that could have been a, a great win in that, that competition with China uh, into a, a propaganda disaster. And, and look, keep in mind, even, even if, if we hadn't fully withdrawn, we could have kept Bagram. And, and had a threat to the, the Chinese. And, and you know, I think we could have worked out a deal with a transitional government in Afghanistan uh, to have maintained a presence, uh, a, a small presence, at least an air power presence at Bagram uh, that would have kept us in the area uh, if folks thought that was a useful deterrent against China. Now, I granted Afghanistan has a border with China. It's a relatively small border. 
China is going to benefit, but they have been for years from mineral extraction in, in Afghanistan. But the, but the great benefit China got wasn't us withdrawing. I mean, China loved the fact that we were in Afghanistan. They loved the fact that we were spending $3 billion a month in Afghanistan uh, trying to turn the country into Denmark uh, while they were spending $3 billion a month launching three new guided missile frigates uh, you know, from their shipyards. And uh, so they, they were big fans of us staying in Afghanistan. Uh, but, but the manner in which we withdrew uh, w w was, was, you know, uh, so, so heartbreaking that we, 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 we handed the Chinese a propaganda victory that was, that is almost immeasurable in value. And so, uh, yeah, I understand what, what, what Kurt's getting at and, uh, uh, respect the question, but I think that ultimately we had, we couldn't, we, it was unsustainable to continue to try and nation build in Afghanistan where we had an existential threat to the, the United States of America and our leadership of the free world with China. And, uh, and, uh, it's not an either or question, but, but to some extent, it, you know, there we just couldn't spend those resources there. We had to spend the resources. You know, we, we could have built three new Constellation class frigates. We could have built two new uh, DDG 51s, uh, Arleigh Burks. We could have built, you know, one and, and a half uh, Virginia class submarines every month for what we were spending in Afghanistan. And, and think of it, over a year, we could have had 36 frigates for what we spent in Afghanistan. Now, I'm not talking about maintaining and manning them, but at least it the cost of the platform. So, so that was unsustainable. China knew that, and so China loved the fact that we were there at the level we were. But we, we certainly could have been stayed involved on a, on a much lower, with, with the withdrawal, with a proper transition, uh, transitional government. Uh, we, we could have stayed in there much longer and, and, not, and, and gotten our people and our material out in a way that didn't hand the Chinese this massive victory. You know, as, and as far as uh, uh, Joe's question, you know, how does this affect us I, in, in the greater competition with China? We have to do what we said. The, the Biden administration has been very clear. We pulled out of Afghanistan so that we could focus on the Asia Pacific, the Indo-Pacific region. If that's true, we need to take some of that combat power that we had in Afghanistan and we've got to put it squarely in the Indo-Pacific, bringing it back to Fort Carson or Fort Bliss or uh, Fort Hood or, or uh, Quantico or, or Pendleton doesn't do it. We have to put it out there in the Pacific and show that this was an actual move from Afghanistan to the Pacific, not just a move to come home, that we covered up with some rhetoric about confronting China. Great, uh, just about eight minutes left in the session. Wanted to weave to a different part of the world, and I believe we uh, have the ambassador from Brazil joining us in our uh, audience. A question about Brazil, and I actually traveled with you, Robert, on your uh, trip with Kimberly Reed and others to Brazil, Kimberly Reed being the president of the Export Import Bank during the administration. Uh, what are the real challenges and opportunities you see in that region? You know, with Bolsonaro, who faces a, a tough re-election campaign, um, somewhat of a transformational figure, very controversial. I guess uh, an advocate would say, finally bringing capitalism and reform to Brazil. Um, I'll let the opposition for uh, to him speak for herself. Where do you see Brazil and the rest of the region going, and what are the key interests that we have there? Well, look, Brazil is one of the great countries in the world. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to do as, as national security advisor was create an alliance of the great democracies against the authoritarian governments. I mean, in the old days, you had this non-aligned movement with India and Brazil and other countries that were you know, somehow somewhat uh, not aligned with the, in the, the Cold War between the US and the, the Soviet Union. We don't have room for a non-aligned movement any, any longer. And we have got to be, you know, just, just locked arms with the great democracies. And, and Brazil and India topped that. Uh, we didn't get around to working on the Indonesia issue as much as I would like to. That was kind of a second term priority. But if you take Indonesia and Brazil and, and India, these great democracies, and you pull them into the free world and fully integrate them into our, our economic uh, systems and, uh, and trade and, uh, and diplomacy and uh, defense alliances, you know, that's a tremendous uh, opportunity for, for the democracies in Europe and, and Asia, Japan and, and the United States. I thought Brazil was particularly important because, you know, it's, it's a small part of Brazil, but there's a, there's a chunk of Brazil up above the equator that uh, is in the uh, borders of the North Atlantic. And, uh, and I thought it would be great to have Brazil as a member of NATO. And when I went to Brazil with you uh, and, and some of the others on that trip, we talked to, to President Bolsonaro and, and there's real interest in in Brazil, uh, becoming a, a member of a full member of NATO. I mean, maybe starting out as a partner and then becoming a full member of NATO, which would be terrific for the uh, for the alliance and 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 for the free world. So, 
Uh, Brazil is a massive economy, very smart people, uh, a strong democracy. Uh, President Bolsonaro was a, was a close uh, a collaborator and friend with us on, on many diplomatic issues. But the Chinese understand this as well. And so the Chinese are pumping you know, billions of dollars into Brazil. They would love to take over the 5G network and backbone of Brazil so that they would have access to, to all of the information on, on every individual Brazilian, but also all the security information in Brazil. So one of the reasons Kim Reed came with me and, uh, and we had representatives from the, the Development Finance Corporation, the DFC there, was to, to do deals with Brazil, to, to invest in Brazil, to make sure that we uh, presented them with incentives for, for staying with us on tech and on, on 5G and, uh, and really integrating them into uh, the, 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 the League of Democracies, so to speak. And, and, and Brazil should have a leading role and a leading voice along with India, Western Europe, the United States, and Japan as we confront these authoritarian leaders. So I, I think Brazil is a, the country, a country of the future. I think it, it shouldn't be in with BRICS. It shouldn't be in with, with Russia. And uh, I don't think Brazil or India should be with, with, you know, tied in with Russia and China and BRICS. Uh, the, the Brazil and, and India should be tied to the United States and, and our allies, Japan and, and Western Europe. And, and I think it will be. And in fact, I think Jake Sullivan uh, went to Brazil pretty recently as one of his first foreign visits. I, I applauded that trip. And, and there was a leak by Glenn Greenwald, who seems to be the, uh, you know, left-wing journalist who breaks more stories these days than uh, just about anybody, maybe other than Kurt Mills, but, uh, uh, but uh, Glenn uh, broke the story that, uh, that NATO, and I didn't get this from any government sources, that NATO, that NATO was on the topic of discussions uh, between Jake and uh, President Bolsonaro. And so that's an area where I think the, the Biden administration could make great strides uh, is pulling Brazil into NATO into some sort of partnership or even full membership. And, and that would be great for the free world. All right, and with just about four minutes left in the session, back to the Pacific with a question, a final question from Jody McGrath. And she sets this up by saying, there are several existing multilateral military operations in the Pacific that currently exist. For example, to implement UN Security Council sanctions against North Korea, or the current carrier strike group currently in the region. I actually think the Reagan and her task force are still in the Indian Ocean, but I could be updated there. In your opinion, what is the best way forward to engage current partners, Canada, Japan, South Korea, and others, as well as others across the Atlantic, Germany and the Netherlands, as you say, to not only have a military presence, but greater information sharing bandwidth? So I guess a question about alliances, the ones uh, that we tend to think about in deterring China primarily, like Japan and Taiwan, but others uh, in Europe and elsewhere. Well, look, Five Eyes, our Five Eyes Intelligence Sharing Agreement uh, with Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand is critical uh, in that area. Uh, I think uh, Jody may have been referring to the fact that the Queen Elizabeth, the, the new, uh, uh, not, not quite a Nimitz class carrier, but pretty pretty large carrier uh, from the UK. Uh, I've been on her decks and she's a, a terrific ship. Uh, uh, she went on a, a sailed as a task force to uh, the Indo-Pacific region, has been doing exercises with uh, uh, the US, but also with Japan and Singapore and Australia and India. Uh, other countries. Uh, I think she's accompanied by a, a Dutch frigate in addition to a U.S. frigate. frigate. We've got uh, USMC F-35s on our deck. So, you know, that's an example of a, of a real uh, uh, integrated alliance-driven uh, task force in the Pacific sending a, uh, a message to, uh, to our adversaries, but also sending a message to our friends that we're, we're committed to the Indo-Pacific with our allies. Uh, obviously, the Quad is the most important thing right now in the Indo-Pacific, the, the uh, partnership between India, Australia, Japan, uh, and the U.S., and, and that's something that, you know, again, to their credit, the Biden administration is, is continuing our efforts to build the Quad to make it, uh, you know, a very powerful counterweight to China uh, in the Indo-Pacific, and then I think you're going to see the Quad working with South Korea, working with uh, New Zealand, working with the Philippines and, and Thailand, which are both U.S. treaty allies that have kind of drifted a little bit uh, in recent years, but need to, need to be pulled back. Uh, and then there are countries that aren't necessarily allies of the US, but where we have great relations and, and value their sovereignty. They may not be de democracies, but a country like Vietnam values its sovereignty. They're, they're tough as heck and, uh, and they're real fighters as, the, the, as we ourselves learned, but as also as the Chinese learned back in 1978. And, and I think Vietnam wants to do whatever it can to maintain its independence and its sovereignty from encroachment from China. Uh, and so I think you're going to find opportunities for the U.S. and the Quad and our, our treaty allies to work with countries like Vietnam that, that don't want to submit to uh, uh, becoming tributes to tributary countries to uh, uh, the, the great uh, CCP in Beijing. So I think we've got a lot of opportunities working with friends and allies in the Indo-Pacific. And, 
And that's one of the, the inherent advantages that we have as the United States. It goes back to your earlier question about political warfare and, and, and using all the tools in, in the U.S. toolkit to uh, uh, yeah, advance our interests. One of those is our, our terrific alliances, both treaty alliances, but also uh, just affinities between us and other countries in the region that, that, that don't exist between uh, China and those countries. All right, we're out of time, unfortunately. We'd like to thank everyone for joining us for your great questions. A special thanks to Ambassador Robert O'Brien for participating in today's discussion. We hope to see all of you again in, uh, soon at a future Center for the National Interest event. Thank you. Great to be with you. Thank you, Christian.